and welcome to our virtual winter star party. What a day it has been for space. And we're certainly going to be talking a lot about the Mars mission. My name is Rachel. I'm the staff astronomer at the Ontario Science Centre. I'm so excited to be bringing this star party to you this evening. Some of you might be wondering, well, what is a star party? I haven't heard of that before. Star parties are events typically made up of uh, telescopes, uh, you might have some guest speakers, a little bit of trivia and activities. Uh, we host them typically when we're open at the Ontario Science Centre several times a year together with our partners and friends at the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Toronto Centre. And we're bringing it to you tonight virtually. This is our third virtual star party. I'm so glad uh, that you are all able to join us tonight. Now it may be cloudy where you are, it may be clear where you are, so we're going to give you a lot of target objects that you can look at uh, and we have uh, a lot of images to share with you of the night sky. I want to begin this evening, uh, we're going to be talking quite a bit about the sky, but I want to begin first by acknowledging the land. I am not uh, at the Ontario Science Centre right now. I'm joining you from my home in Toronto, which is also the land where the Ontario Science Centre operates. Uh, Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and it is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, Huron-Wendat peoples, and the Mississaugas of the Credit, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. As a settler, I'm so grateful to be able to live and work on this land, uh, which has been cared for alongside those who have cared for it since time immemorial. Some of you may be joining from outside of Toronto. There are many resources available uh, where you can learn a little bit more about the land, peoples and treaties where you live. Uh, there are what, several websites available that I found really useful. One is the website whose.land and the other is native-land.ca. This virtual star party is going to be interactive, so we're going to have some trivia questions that we're going to be posing to you, so we want to see you answering those questions, but we also want you to be asking us questions, so please type those into the comments section. Uh, we love to see your comments and questions throughout this event. Um, we're really looking forward to engaging with you and uh, we're open, of course, to any respectful dialogue and discussion, but any comments that are inappropriate will be uh, deleted and blocked uh, to ensure a safe and enjoyable experience for our staff, our partners, and uh, fellow viewers. We have a whole amazing team to bring you this star party tonight. I already introduced you to my I already introduced myself, uh, so I want to introduce some of my co-hosts for the evening. First up, we have Louise, one of our planetarium hosts. Hi, Louise. Hi, Rachel. So good to see you. So glad you're joining us tonight. Glad to be here. <clears throat> Next up, we have Chris, a uh, member of the RASC Toronto Center. Chris Vaughn, some of you hey, may everybody. also know as Astro Geo Guy, does uh, regular astronomy skylights. Uh, so I encourage you to check, check those out as well. He'll be giving us a guided tour of the winter sky a little bit later. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Bhairavi Shankar, who is joining us, also a member of the RESC Toronto Centre and founder of Indus Space and a planetary scientist. Uh, so great to have you with us, Bhairavi. Hi there. On telescopes, uh, we have Ian, Francois, and Blake joining us uh, this evening. So thank you so much uh, to each of you for sharing the various objects that you've imaged uh, and filmed through your telescope. So excited to see those. Behind the scenes, we have a whole team uh, bringing this event to you. So I want to say a special thank you to uh, Jana, uh, Jana, Andrew, Leah, Carrie, and Andrea. So thank you so much, everyone. And let's get this event underway. I think we're going to kick things off uh, with Louise and Chris doing some trivia about the moon. But if you're interested in Mars, hold tight, because it's going to be coming your way shortly. All right, Chris, are you ready for some trivia? I'm ready. Uh, hopefully our, our viewers are ready. All right, so if you've got answers, then just start typing them into the chat function. All right, so first trivia question. What phase of the moon will Australia see? All right, so we've got some possibilities here. The new moon, a quarter moon, 
uh, gibbous and full. So what do you think? We're, uh, we're here in Toronto, uh, Northern Hemisphere. I mean, do we see the same phase that, that Australians would see? Well, first of all, do we know what phase the moon is in tonight if there weren't any clouds in the sky? So I happen to, to do a little investigating using my astronomy software. And I know that the moon is a couple of days before first quarter. So the folks that are lucky enough to have clear skies will see that nicely, almost half illuminated moon shining in the southwestern sky about now. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, I, what I can do in my software here is I can actually um, travel us to different places on the world. So right now I've got uh, a full, a full uh, wide field view of the, of the sky simulated over the Science Center for tonight right at right now. What I can do is I'll just zoom in on that a little bit so you can see the moon up close. So we can see that we've got the moon near Mars tonight. And that's another one of the reasons that we're, we scheduled the event for this evening is we've got moon, the moon not far from Mars tonight. And let's fly us to, to Sydney, Australia and see what we see. All right, so most of the answers we're getting through our chat. Uh, people are saying quarter moon. So let's see what Australians would see. There you are. So the trick here is that everybody on Earth sees the same phase of the moon, whatever it happens to be. And when it's new, no one on Earth can see the moon because it's uh, hidden in the glare of the sun. But tonight uh, in Toronto and also uh, down under in Australia and the Southern Hemisphere and all around the world, people will be seeing this crescent moon. We, we still call it crescent. It's not more than 50% full yet. Gibbous is when it's more than 50%. So it's almost half full. Right. Okay. Yeah. So wherever you are, we're going to be seeing the same phase. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the next trivia question. How many moon craters are named after women? Oh, wow. That's, that's a tough one. Um, we've got yeah. less than 5%, 5 to 10%, 10 to 25% and greater than 25%. Oh, I don't know. What do you think, Chris? Well, the craters on the moon are traditionally named after noted scientists in history and also uh, explorers, uh, famous explorers, including um, the people who went to the North Pole and places like that. So we can imagine that there are lots of craters named after some of our famous astronomers like Galileo and Copernicus and people like that. But I suspect that women haven't quite got a fair shake there, that there probably aren't that many. So I'm yeah. going to say it's a, it's a low number. And actually, I did a little research, and I'll tell you, everybody, uh, how many I think there are right now once uh, we get a few answers coming in the chat. Do any, okay. you have any answers? Uh, we're getting mostly people saying a less than 5%. And, and actually, that's the answer I would pick, too. So let's see what the answer is. Yeah, sadly, less than 5%. That's right. I'm actually going to bring up a picture of the moon, a globe of the moon showing some of the craters named after famous women on the moon. So um, at the present time, there are about 33 craters named for, for women on the moon, mainly famous scientists and astronomers, uh, people like, and, oh, and some astronauts. So we have um, uh, Marie Curie. We have uh, some of the famous astronomers that worked at the Harvard University, like Annie Jump Cannon and uh, Henrietta Swan-Levitt. And if you don't know those names, you should look them up because Astronomers today owe a lot to those ladies that worked out uh, a lot of information about how stars work back in the day. Um, one of the, uh, uh, actually, um, craters are getting named all the time, and the International Astronomical Union, who are responsible for naming objects in the solar system, uh, recently named the most recent crater for a woman, and her name is Anne, Annie Jean Easley, and she passed away in 2011. And she was an African-American uh, computer scientist that worked for NASA. So if you saw the movie Hidden Figures, um, you may have seen her in there. Uh, Dorothy Vaughn is also has a crater on the moon named after her. And I'll just show you where, um, where Annie Easley's crater is. It's in the, actually it's sort of on the edge of the moon. We don't get a good cl clear view of it from Earth here. I've got actually a, a, a zoomed in version of the moon that I can show you here. So there's a big crater on the, uh, so in the southern hemisphere of the moon named Humboldt. And her crater is sitting right about here. And it's about midway between this crater Humboldt and this crater named Curry. Oh, nice. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I, I love that movie, Hidden Figures. I was just blown away by the 
complex mathematics that they were doing without the use of like computers or calculators or anything all done by hand all right next trivia question the largest crater on the moon is as big as some answers here the ontario science center toronto ontario or as big as canada all right so i'd like to see what uh, our audience mm. members have to say about this one i mean there's some pretty big craters on the moon so hmm yeah and and sometimes you're when you're looking at the moon you're actually seeing craters and you may not realize you're seeing them so the the dark patches that we see on the moon even with our unaided eyes those are actually gigantic craters or we call them basins that got blasted into hollows many millions of years ago you know soon after the moon was formed and then later those were infilled or flooded with the dark uh, gray basaltic rock there's one um, right in the sort of middle of the moon near the top hem northern hemisphere of the moon, um, Chimera Imbrium, and it has a it has a curved edge that you can easily see in your binoculars or backyard telescope. So it's a big crater, but it's not the answer we're looking for. Mm. I don't know. What do you think, Chris? What's your guess? Uh, I'm going to say as big as a province. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I'll go with Ontario as well. All right, and let's see what kind of answers we're getting from the audience. Mm, uh, well, kind of all over the place. Some say maybe Canada, possibly Toronto, city-sized. Okay, well, let's take a look. Aha, so that's the, that's the Aitken Basin. It's on the, uh, the far side of the moon. And uh, this, this picture that we're seeing here is actually a map of the moon's elevations. So the dark blue and purple areas are the low, the hollow areas, and the reds are the more higher uphill areas. And so that, mm. that's a big, deep uh, basin that uh, something slammed into the moon long ago. So that's a, that's a big crater. Mm -hmm. All right, so province-sized. Okay. Cool. All right, so I think what we can do now is we'll move on and look at some... Uh, some telescope views of the moon. Yeah, let's see what our telescope operators, if they've got some nice images of the moon. Uh, I think uh, first one up will be an image from Francois. He's got uh, an image of the moon in a waxing crescent phase. All right, so that's similar to what we're seeing this evening. Um, I think I think this is probably a, a picture he took some time ago on a clear night because we're not getting that clear sky. Uh, tonight anywhere in the province but uh, yeah so so as I said you know look at the moon with your unaided eyes or with your binoculars or if you have a backyard telescope and the more you magnify the more details you see so this is a great a great image of the moon the whole moon all at once through your through the eyepiece so you know use a low magnification eyepiece and you can get the whole moon um, all at once in your eyepiece it's amazing Oh, oh, we've got this really great question coming in from the audience. How big is the moon in comparison to Earth? Let's see. So the moon is small compared to the Earth, but it's actually big as far as moons go, if, you know, moons in the solar system go. Let's yeah, see I, think, can... I think our moon is one of the largest moons in the solar system, isn't it? In, in proportion to the planet, yeah. In We're proportion almost, to the planet. Earth and the moon are almost like a almost like a double planet idea. So the moon is about 28% uh, the diameter of Earth. So it's about a third the size of the Earth. And that, that's big. Mm -hmm. That is big. All right. Well, actually, maybe at this point where we can have uh, Bhairavi join us in uh, because she is, the moon is her specialty. She might be able to give us some interesting comments and insights about the moon. Really looking forward to hearing from Bhairavi as a planetary scientist. She has lots of insight into the moon and Mars. We're seeing such a beautiful view here. Hello. Hi, Bhairavi. Hi. <laughs> um. All right, and so just to give Bhairavi an introduction, uh, Bhairavi Shankar, uh, she has a doctorate in uh, geological planetary science, and so uh, she brings a wealth of knowledge and information to this, and so I get to grill you with some questions about the moon while you're here with me. 
Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, actually, um, let's see. Uh, well, actually, what you could tell me about us about is a little bit about um, the upcoming missions to the moon. Uh, and I've heard about Artemis. Uh, we're sending NASA is going to be sending astronauts back to the moon. This is the first time in decades, really. And maybe if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, why we're interested in going back to the moon. What what's the draw, and what are we looking for when we're going to the moon? Yeah. So I will um, firstly say how excited it is for us to sort of have this event and like have a chat about the moon and soon about Mars. But to answer your question, you're right. Artemis is now the uh, the mission uh, that everyone is super excited about, mainly because it is um, the most recent opportunity for us uh, say North America, to now start actively sending astronauts to the moon. And, and so there's a lot of thrill, a lot of excitement, and a lot of like innovation being um, uh, tried and tested as we try to uh, achieve that. So the Artemis mission is um, the recent announcement that came out of NASA. The plan is in over three stages. They essentially want to be able to not only now have an ISS 2.0, so think about it like a, an orbiting lab around the moon, but eventually take that one step further and actually have a lunar base, because then it just means that it's a little easier for us to explore the moon, continue to answer our questions that we still have, even after 50 years of having um, been there. Uh, but it also serves as a stepping stone for us to then explore beyond our Earth's moon system. So Mars being that next immediate step. So there's a lot of excitement and a lot of plans. And honestly, uh, Artemis 1 will, will um, if everything goes as per plan, it'll launch by later this fall. Um, so that's a test mission. And then by Artemis 2 into 3 is when we can get astronauts going as well. And I'll add, um, that's it's not just at NASA who wants to send astronauts. The Canadian Space Agency is also um, planning on sending two of our own astronauts in all of that uh, mission. So very exciting times to go back to the moon. Yeah. Are these astronauts, are they, are they going to be staying on the surface for an extended period of time? Are, are there any plans to build a possibly permanent station on the moon? There are plans around it. It's just a, uh, um, it's in like stages of how exactly um, would you achieve that? Where would you go? So for the image that uh, you had shared at the last trivia question, um, that was actually the far side. So, um, you know, the, the side that we don't see from Earth, but it's also the side that has so much to tell us about just how our own like satellite formed. Uh, and and where we want to go and explore. And so the far side and the polar regions are one of those top areas. So if everything goes as per plan and we can um, we can you know send humans and do some exploration, um, those are the areas, the top areas that everyone is thinking about revisiting. Oh, okay. That is super exciting. And I've got, we've got some more images coming in from our telescope operators. Um, this image is from Ian. Uh, he's got a short compilation of, uh, of moon images. Oh, uh, that oh, is nice. so cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, so what we're seeing right here are um, this range of like these dark features and the circular features that are, the circular ones are craters. They have, uh, some of them are from original lunar crust. And then the darker regions are more volcanic areas that are filling into large basins, but then also um, indicating the volcanic activity that happened on the moon. So these are great images. Um, I always get goosebumps seeing them <laughs> from telescope views. Is the moon still geologically active at this point? I mean, it looks just like all dry rock, but I do recall during some of the, the like the Apollo missions, they had put down sensors to try and sense like tremors. Right, so, so there are sensors, you're right, and they detect moonquakes 
similar idea of how earthquakes might happen on Earth, but really moonquakes are, are thought to be more um, indicative that something is hitting the planet. So think of like these impact events. The moon doesn't have an atmosphere, so anything that hits it will be recorded in some way. So those sensors are essentially um, able to, um, in some ways, if they are large events, they can detect it. But geologically speaking, the moon has is not... Uh, fully active, not volcanically active. Uh, um, there are small regions where it might be, but overall they think that the volcanism was a thing of the past. Mm. I've got some really great audience questions here. Uh, one is, does the moon have underground water? Oh, man, that that is that would be really cool if it did, right? But does it? I think, what do you think? That, that is a great question. So water on the moon is yet another exciting topic that um, uh, everyone wants to explore in more detail. These are a few, uh, some of the reasons being, um, if you look at the poles, there are areas on the moon that are in what are known as permanently shadowed regions. That means that those parts of the, moon's, the moon don't get sunlight in any way. So there are, uh, there is a high chance, and actually missions have now shown that there are these regions around the poles where uh, water is trapped. It could be in ice form, it could have been um, a, a placed maybe from comet material impacting or things like that. And so it is a great um, a process to go and investigate, find out, and if we want to send humans, extracting that water will really help rather than us lugging a whole lot of water uh, right here from Earth for them to be, um, to survive and stay on the moon for long periods. Yeah, for sure. And that would help. I mean, if there was, if we were thinking of building a station there, and I think actually one of the audience members asked about this, about the station. Yeah, that would be really, really helpful. Right. So the station would have to be in a place where, I mean, uh, you'd have to still be able to communicate. So how those are some of those challenges that are constantly being looked at. Like, where would you place them in a way that it's not going to be too um, cold, the moon has very extreme conditions, so you want to be able to have your astronauts be able to do the work, but also survive. Uh, and then how are they going to extract that water and any of the resources and maybe explore uh, scientific uh, interesting areas? I see Chris is here. Let's get his thoughts. Yeah, I've, well. I've actually put my uh, my moon model up on the screen here where we can show where the crater Clavius is and explain a little bit about the recent NASA discovery of water molecules on the day on the Sort of sunlit side of the moon. Mm -hmm. mm. So the, the way you find this crater is if you look at the, the moon, you look for the, what I, I always see Wilma Flintstone's face when I look at the moon, but other people see uh, the man in the moon in other pictures. But the bright crater near the bottom center of the moon is Tycho. And it has, um, it has those ray systems that emanate from it in all directions, which is material blasted out of it. And below that or south of that, there's a big crater called Cla Clavius or Cla Clavius. And that's where uh, the NASA Sophia, um, it, it's a 737, I think, airplane that they put the, um, the sensor in and they fly. And they uh, were looking for um, signatures of molecules that are bouncing off the moon. And they found water molecules um, on the surface or within the rocks of the surface, didn't they? Uh -huh. Yeah, so um, the, it's it's a continuous uh, process of us understanding where the water is, how is it there, what might have brought it around, and really how long does it stay trapped in the in the rocks. So, um, really neat topics. All right, I've got another audience question here, and uh, this I guess it relates to what you were saying about you know finding a place for astronauts to be so they're not too hot and not too cold, but what's the average temperature on the moon? Oh, it's easily in the few negative, few um, tens to hundreds of Celsius is my, it, it ranges depending on if you're on the, the sunlit side or the, or not. And so that, that range in temperatures can vary, but it's, it's quite cold. Yeah, That's I guess right. because there's no atmosphere, just there's going to be this very big variation depending on where you're, what side of the moon, and yeah. Yeah, 
And um, so I mentioned the negative side, so that's clearly on the colder end, but on the, on the hotter end, it does get into a few uh, tenths to hundreds of degrees on the hotter end as well. So yeah, you, there isn't a, a happy medium. <laughs> uh, and and if the, you'd have to be really well covered to be able to withstand that. Well, that's why the astronauts had to have this uh, circulatory system in their suits to allow the the temperature to be equalized, depending on if this, the side of their body facing the sun and the side of their body in shadow mm -hmm. um, needed to balance out. Yeah. Okay, and I've so. got this question from uh, Rayanne, who's six years old. And the question is, why can't we see the dark side of the moon? Great question. Uh, so th that has to be, do a bit with uh, the Earth-Moon system, um, when both Earth and Moon were in their early days, they were orbiting, or Moon was orbiting uh, Earth and Earth was going around the Sun, but over the course of time, their spin rates managed to be in a bit of a dance of its own, that over time, they, the same side of the Moon was, was uh, visible from Earth. They became tidally locked. That's the phrase that they um, call it. And so because of that, I mean, the Earth is still moving around the sun. It is rotating. We have our day. The moon's doing something similar. But just the way that sort of um, a period has worked out is where we are now only able to see the near side. And so um, what we were able to tell about the far side is really thanks to um, launching and sending satellites that are now orbiting the moon and able to get that full view. And, and then we know now what the far side looks like, like that picture showed us. Right. Thanks, Bhairavi. All right. So now at this point, we're going to have a, a short video and it's going to be about um, taking photographs with your phone. If you want to, maybe not tonight, if you're in the Toronto area, it's quite cloudy, but if it's on a clear night, you might possibly be able to get some really good images. So there's going to be some good tips coming up on how to do that. And then hopefully afterwards, we'll, we'll be able to come back to some more questions from the audience. Hi, That's great. let's look at how you can take amazing pictures of the moon with a smartphone and telescope. Set up your telescope. Find the moon in the sky and in your telescope. Focus and hold steady. Take lots and lots of pictures of the moon with your smartphone's camera. Now it's time to select and edit your photo. You can use your smartphone's built-in photo editing tools, along with any other apps if you choose, to rotate, crop, and edit your photo. Get creative and try experimenting with editing options to bring out the moon's details. Share your beautiful moon photos with friends and family or on social media. Keep looking up. What a great and inspiring tip. That was actually created by another member of the RASC Toronto. So special thanks to Tanya for creating that video for all of us. And hopefully some of you are inspired to get out there and try to take some images of the moon with your own smartphone device. Uh, I'd love to see the telescope views again uh, uh, and see uh, one, the uh, view that uh, Blake is sharing of the moon is really, really uh, lovely. Uh, it actually, you can actually spot, I believe, uh, the International Space Station uh, just there passing uh, in front of the face of the moon uh, where uh, Blake's cursor is. So that's really, really awesome to be able to see that in such detail. Um, I think that uh, we've been seeing t a lot of amazing questions coming in. So I'm really uh, looking forward to getting back to those shortly, but I want to keep keeps that trivia happening, keep, keep you thinking about uh, um, uh, some questions that we have for you as well. So we were talking about the moon. So the first question we have for you uh, is related to that, but we're making a bit of a shift now to talk about 
vehicles. Uh, kind of the theme of the day, vehicles in space. Um, so uh, the first question we have for you is, did astronauts drive on the moon? True or false? What does everyone think? We're having uh, quite a lot of questions that had come in about, about potential for, for living on the moon, um, one day setting up a space station uh, there. So that was really awesome to hear uh, uh, by Robbie's insights into that. But this, you know, uh, would have been around the time of the Apollo missions, because those are the only astronauts we've sent to the moon so far, between 1969 to 1972. Uh, so do you think they were driving around on the moon back then? Let's see what our audience thinks. What do you think, Louise? I, I think true. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the younger visitors of the, to the planetarium at the Science Center they would all be nodding their head right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> if, so if you visited the Science Center, you've spotted the moon buggy and the lunar horizon, and you would be correct. Uh, most of our audience is saying true, so you've got it. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the lunar roving vehicle or the uh, moon buggy, as it was affectionately called, um, uh, was uh, used in some of the later Apollo missions. This is uh, uh, Harrison Schmidt driving uh the uh, lunar rover on the very last Apollo mission, he was the only astronaut to go to the moon that was a scientist. He was actually a geologist. So that is a really cool fun fact about that image as well. So next question, what was the first rover to drive on Mars? We had the most exciting thing happen today. Another <laughs> rover landed on Mars and I'm so excited to talk about it next. But what was the first one? Uh, a, curiosity, B, opportunity, C, spirit, or D, sojourner? Let's see, what do uh, we think? Put your answers into the chat. Uh, do you talk about uh, rovers in the planetarium, uh, Louise? Uh, we do. So, but unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to show any of the visitors, like some of the rovers that have gone to Mars, because mm. there's there's been at least, there's been a few. So, you know, which one was the first here? Uh, unfortunately for me, my memory is not the greatest. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. So I'm hoping that some of the audience members might be able to help us out here. I don't know. Well, we're seeing that D is very popular, Sojourner. And so if you said D, you are correct. So Sojourner was the first rover to drive on Mars. Note that I said drive specifically because there were some uh, uh, missions and that were uh, uh, that were sent previously to that that uh, failed to to oper operate. It's really challenging and really hard uh, to land a rover on Mars successfully. So Sojourner was part of the Pathfinder mission in 1997. And so uh, after that time, uh, we had um, uh, Spirit and Opportunity uh, arrive together in uh, 2004. And then most uh, until until today, most recently was the Curiosity rover in 2012, and then today uh, we have the Perseverance rover. So this is an image that you can see that was taken by uh, the Pathfinder mission. And so Journey was a tiny little rover. It was about the size of a microwave. Um, so similar to like maybe kind of a large remote control vehicle. Yeah, that's such a rocky terrain. I, I yeah, I can imagine it's really tough to land successfully so it's a major accomplishment yeah and so you can see here several of the different landing sites not just of rovers um but also of landers that have uh been uh uh made it to the surface of mars specifically for nasa missions uh led by the united states we're going to talk a little bit later about some international missions that have arrived on mars as well but you can see the kind of spread out all over the surface very few near the poles a lot are concentrated around the equator um, but uh, lots of interesting things to explore on mars next question opportunity rover surpassed its life expectancy by three times, 10 times, 60 times, or it didn't outlast its life expectancy. So 
what do we all think? I can give you a bit of a clue. It's life expectancy, it's mission length, was originally supposed to be only 90 days. So that is a bit of a clue. So let us know what you think. I really, uh, I really love the Spirit and Opportunity Rovers. I think growing up for me, they were, you know, uh, a really exciting missions. And I think, uh, I think uh, really, really memorable. And what I hope uh, Perseverance will be like for the next generation. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, let's see what kind of answers we're getting. Me personally, I think it's, I think it's 60 times because I, mm -hmm. I would think that the scientists and the engineers, they probably put in all sorts of fail safes and did an incredible job. So I think, hmm, okay, some people are saying answer B 10 times and yeah. some people are saying it did outlast its life expectancy. Yeah, and we're seeing some people saying C now, starting to show lots of C. All right, so it did surpass its life expectancy by, believe it or not, 60 times. Uh, 15 years, opportunity made it up to 15 years. Uh, unfortunately, its mission was ended after the last global dust star storm on Mars and wasn't able to recharge after that event. Um, but it did such an incredible job and a very ambitious rover uh, that was able to continue for, for a very, very long time. Next question, curiosity is as big as A, a cat, B, a desk, C, a car, D, a house, curiosity rover. So I mentioned Sojourner was about the size of a microwave um, or a cat, <laughs> big, big cat. <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, let's see what our audience has to say about this. And um, uh, I think that uh, curiosity was the first first mission i believe to use the sky crane technology which was was also used today to land on the surface of the planet of the red planet so that might give you a bit of a clue as to how heavy that rover is that it can't just be dropped on the surface it had to be lowered gently by a crane mm. okay so just let us know in the chat some of we're starting to see some responses coming in. Most people I think are seeing that, you know, it's it's maybe big, bigger than a cat. Um, it's kind of, kind of a bit of a mix. Um, if you said car, you were correct. So curiosity and now perseverance are the size of a car. So actually quite quite a large car, um, uh, a van. Uh, uh, they are uh, very, very large and very heavy. Um, uh, and that is why that sky crane uh, technology is used that we can show you and talk a little bit more about later. So here's an image of Curiosity that's taken on the surface of the red planet. Um, and what's awesome about this image is it's actually a selfie. It took this picture itself. You might be wondering, wait, how what else is there? How did it take a picture? How do we have a photo of it? It took a photo of itself. So selfies can happen on Mars. And how it works is it actually takes a bunch of different images and it moves its uh, robotic arm. And all of those images are taken by scientists and stitched together uh, and cleaned up. So you can actually see here down at the bottom, there's a little bit of a, a white streak and that's uh, what's left behind as they've uh, erased the arm of the rover. So what's left behind is we get a lovely shot of curiosity against the Martian landscape. And uh, in comparison, we don't have any similar images yet uh, of Perseverance because it's still, uh, you know, turning all its instruments on and getting, getting all of those ready to go. Uh, but hopefully we will soon. Uh, this is an artist's impression of what Perseverance will look like on Mars. So quite similar in design uh, to, um, to Curiosity. And Perseverance wasn't traveling alone. It uh, was traveling with another uh, um, uh, experiment uh, called Ingenuity. And so the, next, the final question is, Ingenuity is a 
A, space helicopter, B, robotic drone, D, tiny stowaway, or D, all of the above. Uh, so let us know what you think. Um, both uh, Perseverance and Ingenuity are part of the Mars 2020 mission, which launched last July. So um, a pretty exciting day today to, to have them finally arrive. What do you think, Louise? I think I'm going to pick D, all of the above. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, it was stowed away <laughs> and it can do all those things. Helicopter drone. I think. I think it could do all of those things. All right, let's see what our audience is saying. Um, is somebody's picked space helicopter. I think that's actually a really cool description. Yeah, <laughs> I, when I first heard about it, uh, it was uh, it was so you know it just captures the imagination. Um, a and B are very popular. Yeah, so. Um, the answer is D, so all of the above. So if you said A, you're correct. If you said B, you're correct. If you said C, you're correct. If you said D, you're correct. Because it is technically all of those things. Uh, it is a tiny stowaway because it is tucked under the belly of the Perseverance uh, rover. Um, and so after a few days, um, once Perseverance gets settled onto the surface of Mars, uh, Ingenuity is going to be uh, a technology demonstration where it's actually going to drop lower from underneath the belly of Perseverance onto the surface uh, and then attempt a flight on Mars, which is just incredible. I mean, if any of you have seen some of the incredible drone uh, footage of, uh, filmed from Earth of our beautiful planet, uh, it's just stunning and exciting to think about, you know, what is in store for aerial views of Mars that are much nearer uh, to us than um, what we can uh, what we can see from the from the orbiters. Exactly. I'd love to yeah I'd love to yeah. invite back uh, uh, um, uh, Chris and Bhairavi uh, and uh, I'm seeing in a Blake's telescope we do have a view of Mars that we can share uh, just a stunning image of Mars taken in uh, the David Dunlap Observatory 74 inch telescope, one of the largest telescopes in Canada. Um, just such incredible detail. This is actually the Mars as it was seen last October, right. um, would be quite different looking tonight if you were to look at it through your telescope or through binoculars because Mars is much further away from us uh, right now. This is when it was at its, its closest uh, to Earth last year. Um, but uh, incredible detail. I believe Ian also has uh, an image that he can share using an eight inch telescope uh, for comparison um, that was from the close approach last fall. Uh, really, really incredible to see those features and details of Mars. Just love getting the chance to look at planets through a telescope and uh, if it's clear where you are, I definitely encourage you to try uh, to spot uh, Mars. As Chris pointed out earlier, uh, Mars is quite close to uh, the uh, waxing crescent or almost first quarter moon. That's just tonight, though. Just the tonight. Moon, the yes. moon if does it's clear its where thing, you are tonight. Really I'll demo that when we get into our sky tour in a little bit later. Um, yeah. I actually brought up on my screen um, a schematic diagram of the solar inner solar system showing the orbit of the Earth and the orbit of Mars. If um, if uh, the team can put it up for us. So this is the situation that Earth and Mars were in back in October when Mars was at opposition. That means the Earth was between Mars and the Sun. And I've made, I've made Earth and Mars a little bigger than they should be. This is not to scale, but you can see Earth is about twice as big as Mars. That's, that's true. And so at this time of the, um, at this date, they were, they were kind of neighbors of one another. But if I set this now to tonight, and of course, you know, this is around the time when a lot of the missions were launched to Mars, and we'll get into that in a couple of minutes. So we get to tonight, by now, you can see that Earth and Mars are much farther apart from each other. And what that means in the sky is that Mars is a lot dimmer than it was back in October, maybe only one-tenth as bright as it used to be or something even less. And in a telescope, the disk is much tinier than it used to be back in October. So 
Yeah, something something to keep an eye out for, and something something to a uh, great target to look at uh, if you're trying to uh, spot a planet in the sky. Mars uh, should be visible in the sky for the next few months. Uh, these are just such beautiful, uh, awesome views uh, that we're seeing here. We have, um, before we start talking about the international missions, we do have an audience question about the Perseverance mission with regards to the samples that's collected. So it is taking samples of rock and soil. Um, how are samples being sent back? Well, I, I also saw some questions about people fascinated about the rocks on the moon and the rocks on Mars and places like mm -hmm. that. And we could sort of cover all that rather quickly and just say that because the physics and the chemistry of the universe is basically the same everywhere, then we can certainly expect to find the same types of rocks on other planets and other bodies. And so the dark areas in the moon are the same basaltic rocks we have on Earth. So yes, we get the same rocks in different places and we're going to bring some home. That's so awesome. I think for the Perseverance mission, I don't think the mission to bring them home is yet approved. Uh, I think that's still in the works, but the idea is that they would send another mission, a fetch rover, that would then go collect the samples, and then there would be an ascent uh, stage that would, that would launch off of Mars. I think that would be our first time launching anything off of Mars as well. So yeah, and uh, so right now on Perseverance, there are two robotic arms. So one of them will actually have the the drill um, the the instrument, I guess, to drill a core sample. And then once that actually is retrieved, another arm will help it place into the um, uh, into the uh, little vials that they have on on uh, perseverance and essentially that second arm will also drop it down on site so that the future mission can come and pick it up and then send it back so there's there's some parts that we know but really how, how it gets back on earth is, is still a, a yet to be determined I think that will be really exciting. I mean, today was already super, super exciting. It's so challenging to land on another planet. Uh, I think that uh, uh, if anybody has any questions about Mars, Perseverance mission, upcoming missions, um, uh, Perseverance's goals are to uh, explore and search for evidence of ancient life on Mars. What a compelling uh, idea. And it landed in a spot uh, uh, that is also really interesting. So please uh, drop your questions into the comments. We're going to uh, revisit some questions that are here about the moon. Tons of questions about whether the moon had volcanoes. Um, oh, yes. They did. Go ahead, Robbie. <laughs> yeah, so they did. So volcanism, uh, not too active right now on the moon, but early moon's history was, they, it was almost competing with the impact cratering that was also happening on the surface. So once a crater formed, if it was a large basin, it was deep enough, it, it sort of excavated materials from deep, within the moon and typically if you think about it um, even on earth we have our crust but then beneath the the crust we have our mantle and that's all where uh, lava materials can uh, come from and so on the moon same idea um, the large impact basins were able to tap into that deeper uh, sections and essentially volcanic flows started to fill into these basins. There are other parts on the moon where there were more um, like eruptive uh, flows, the ones that we often think of happening on Earth. So the moon has had a volcanic history. And so certainly rock types are either with the basaltic origin or igneous. I saw one question earlier uh, that had asked if um, the volcanic flows were also considered igneous rocks. Yeah, they would they would come from there, but then they got modified and things like that. So and complicated. People can history. actually see them. People can see volcanoes, the evidence of past volcanoes on the moon, but not yet. We need to wait a week until the moon is almost full. So. That's right. I've got yeah. a I've got a view up I can that we can switch to if anybody wants to see the yeah let's take a look the evidence for that so if you start out with the full moon which will happen around the 26th of February so not not quite for a few more days and look in the middle of the moon and sort of just below the center of the moon 
there is a dark patch called Mernubium, and just to the left of that, and you can see this in binoculars and definitely with a little telescope, there's a triangle of three little dark stains, and those are those are the past cinder cones of volcanoes that erupted long ago on the moon. One of one of the neat things I'll, I'll quickly mention about the moon before we switch back to Mars is um, if you happen to have Google Earth Pro uh, at home, um, you can always switch modes to look at the moon as well in that uh, program. And one of the neat things that I love sharing is of how you can see how the near side looks, volcanically speaking, and how similar or different it might look on the far side. And that already starts to bring up questions of what's happening and then things. So it, it helps us always um, explore more about moon's history, volcanic history, and then um, compare it to what we know on Earth or even Mars. That's so great. Thanks for sharing that, Chris. That's a great target for people to look for next time that the moon is full. And I didn't, yeah, I didn't know that uh, you could do that on Google Earth. Uh, so that's awesome. And I have to go do that right after this. <laughs> um, uh, could we take, we'd love to take a look at, uh, I believe Blake's telescope is uh, sharing uh, a view that he, he was able to uh, capture of Mars and the moon together. Um, so let's take a look at that, uh, give you a little bit of an idea. If your sky uh, is clear uh, where you are, uh, you might be able to see something like this tonight. And as Chris mentioned, this is uh, all the, you know, planets are in motion in the sky, so uh, they're often only uh, near to uh, um, uh, other objects, stars and the moon in conjunction um, on, uh, on a given night. Uh, and Blake is just pointing out where Mars is there with his cursor. So if you just uh, um, head out and it happens to be clear where you are, I definitely encourage you uh, to try to spot it. It'll look like a very uh, bright, uh, reddish orange star that is not twinkling <laughs> near uh, near the moon. Thanks for sharing that, Blake. Um, I've got I got another great audience question actually mm -hmm. since we've got this image up and this is coming from Jacob, eight years old, and he asked how exactly how big is the moon? That's a um, great question, right? Well, we, so yeah, we mentioned it earlier, right? So it's it's about. 3,400 30, kilometers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we were off by 200, but... <laughs> it, it's yeah. easier to think of it compared to the Earth. So it's about one-third the size of the Earth. So the Earth like, is often thought to be like 12,000 uh, 12, um, kilometers. Yeah. Yeah. And Mars is about half the size of the Earth, right? And that, oh, not, and that not, has, not quite half, but yeah, you know, close even to smaller? it. smaller? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so thanks so much for that question, Jacob. Uh, we had we had somebody somebody else who asked a similar question about how big is Earth's moon compared to Mars, and then compared to Jupiter. So lots of interest in relative sizes of objects uh, in our solar out. system. <laughs> you figured it out, Chris? Well, so if, if you, you would need to put 11 Earths in a row to, to go across Jupiter. And if the moon is a third the size of Earth, then you'd need uh, 33 moons to go across the diameter of Jupiter, right? Cool. <laughs> Thanks for that question. Uh, lots, of, lots of questions coming in now about perseverance. Um, I'd love to share uh, an image, the first image that's been sent back uh, by the Perseverance rover as it landed safely on Mars. Uh, this is not its uh, uh, the camera that it's going to be using um, uh, throughout the mission. I think this is just the sort of engineer's uh, camera. Um, uh, but uh, camera view, you can see it's still quite dusty there from all the dust that was kicked up as it was as it was landing. You can see part of its shadow. Um, so this is just completely raw image, uh, hasn't been processed yet. So very, very exciting uh, that there is another vehicle on uh, Mars that wasn't there just a few hours ago. Um, so I don't know if anyone was watching, um, but if you missed it, you certainly can uh, rewatch on NASA's channels. Um, but also stay tuned uh, to what's ha going to happen with this mission, because it had more cameras on it than anything we've ever seen 
sent into space. And so mm -hmm. I think there's going to be a lot of awesome footage coming out in the next few days. I think when I read it up, there is, uh, it said 23 cameras on Perseverance and two on Ingenuity. So that is quite a suite of yeah. cameras. Yeah, what, what really excites me about um, Perseverance is it's such a step up from Curiosity because now we're going to be getting stereoscopic pictures. So we could make, may almost make a VR virtual reality presence. Of, uh, and, and they're also going to have microphones so we can actually hear what Mars sounds like. Oh, wow. That's going to be incredible. I'm so excited for that. I'm really excited for the for the for the ingenuity, uh, the 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 helicopter demonstration. Yeah, and and uh, in, with ingenuity, you mentioned about that first test, but if that actually works out, they have four more lined up. So over oh, wow. over thirty Mars days, so salts thirty salts. Um, they if everything goes as per. Um, plans and it's working, then they attempt to do five of those um, flybys. So that will be really exciting. That's awesome. um, on that yep. note, I actually noticed a question, if uh, that's okay to Absolutely. answer. Yeah. Um, so there was a question about Canadian contributions. Um, so if you were wondering if there are, there are a lot. Um, there are a range actually of, of uh, people, both uh, with uh, mission experience and, and uh, from the Canadian Space Agency. So a few names that I'm just going to drop in sequence is, uh, for example, we have Dr. Marie Schmidt. She's from Brock University. She's going to be um, working with the team on one of the instruments called Pixel, um, looking at elemental compositions of the rock. So you can think of Perseverance as your robotic geologist. So all the little tools and, and things that the geologists would need in their uh, belt pocket, <laughs> if you want to think of it like that. So that's all the instruments that Perseverance has. Um, so I mentioned Dr. Schmidt. We have Dr. Uh, Kim Tate. She is from the Royal Astrom uh, Royal uh, Ontario Museum. Um, and so she will also be looking uh, actively on um, samples that get returned back to Earth. Again, looking at it from what the rock compositions are. Can it help us learn more about early Earth? Um, some of the engineers on... on uh, that are Canadian, but are also now based at, at JPL, are Dr. Raymond Francis and Dr. Farah Alibay. They are both actively involved in, in knowing uh, what the rover is doing, what Ingenuity will be doing. So you can certainly follow all of them along. And um, the, we have a chief scientist from the Canadian Space Agency, Dr. Tim Haltigan. He's involved more on the science planning. and. Uh, Dr. Richard Levier from uh, McGill. Uh, and uh, finally, I know there's one more name that I'm spacing out at the moment. Dr. Chris Hurd uh, right. from the University yeah. of Alberta. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. And so, yes, Dr. Hurd will also be uh, looking at samples that come back um, down the road. So everyone is actively ex involved and excited and, and just waiting to get their um, uh, lab analyses going on those samples. Well, it's so there's a, exciting. There is a great question actually uh, coming in from the audience, and it's, uh, can you discuss how the rovers to communicate back to Earth, and the delay in communication? That is a great, great question. It is, uh, Chris. Did you want to take this and? Yeah. So um, I showed the diagram earlier, where the two planets were aligned with one another, and at that time there was probably only a few minutes uh, delay time in radio signals from Earth and Mars to back. But now that Earth has moved much further away from Mars, the delay is much longer, which is one of the reasons why the Perseverance and uh, Curiosity rovers have the seven or eight minutes of terror because humans, we on Earth can't intervene while they're landing. They have to be able to manage that on their own because of the time delay of our radio signals back and forth. So I think I was, I was just gonna look up right now how long Mars is away from us in in um, in sort of light minutes? I think it's about eleven minutes. Uh, I was hearing today that it was taking about eleven, eleven and a half minutes uh, for their two uh, radio signals to be sent to the rover, and then another eleven, eleven and a half minutes for it to come yeah. back. Yeah, it's about yeah. I've got 
yeah, 11 and a half um, minutes each way. Yeah. So the rover was really on its own, uh, even <laughs> even if uh, there was any issues that, that did occur, fortunately did not. Um, but uh, uh, because of that light travel time, that fixed speed of light, uh, that darn fixed speed of light, <laughs> that uh, uh, there was not any way that uh, humans can operate it uh, 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 in real time. Uh, if you haven't uh, checked it out yet, I encourage you to uh, take a look at uh, the Yumigo app uh, that the Ontario Science Centre has partnered uh, with Yumigo to create an app all about space exploration. And one of the uh, activities on it is you can actually pilot uh, the uh, Perseverance rover uh, in augmented re reality on your phone. So not the real rover, <laughs> but uh, you can uh, uh, see what it would be like to be a NASA scientist without uh, that uh, light travel time delay. Um, I will. I will just add real quick. Like even while we were waiting to hear from Perseverance uh, that everything went well, there were two orbiting satellites around Mars that were keeping an eye and, and able to see or, or at least tell if you know things were slowing down as it should have during that seven minutes. So the Maven mission and um, there was one more. Um, Mars or Reconnaissance or Orbiter, I think, was right. the other yeah. one, yeah. So both were able to at least convey that we see this, we think this is happening, so at least on that front, things are going as per plan. But uh, once those uh, signals uh, that Chris mentioned are actually being collected by the deep space networks, and that is all around on Earth. So we have one on, in California, one in Australia, and one in uh, Spain, I believe. And so even they are then able to communicate with mission control and say, okay, we're about to get these signals, et cetera. So it's a whole international team effort, even if this is one country's mission. Yeah, no, I, think it, I think it was Madrid. The rover has to drive itself, right? Yeah. I think it was Madrid that, uh, that received a signal uh, that was coming in today. Um, but uh, oh, cool. I think that... Uh, uh, we're, we'll, we haven't had a chance to talk about the international missions yet, and I want to talk about that next. But before we get to that, uh, we do have a question that's been asked a lot, uh, which is, is there life in space? And I think this is such a great question uh, because it's a big part of what Perseverance's mission is um, and uh, a big part of why the location uh, where it landed uh, was chosen. Um, but Robbie, would you be able to share a little bit more about uh, why uh, Perseverance landed in Jezero Crater? Sure. So um, Jezero Crater, as the name indicates, it's an impact crater, but where it is actually um, located is northern parts of northern hemispheres of Mars. And even then, it's around this transitional elevated area where it is right next to another large basin. I've and, got it up uh, on my screen if you want anybody sure. wants to uh, share that. Yeah. 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 And um, so it is. Um, so it's up yeah. right up in here. Right. Isidus Planitia is the larger basin. And so uh, in their Jezero crater just happens to be in a location where they they know that there was water present. The channels that are on either end of uh, Jezero Crater were essentially carved by water flowing in and out of the crater. And so in that sort of a setting, if you think of what happens on Earth, that just means that a lot of sediments are then deposited and then they sort of are, are the best of locations to essentially have maybe some organic material that then gets compacted. And so these were all um, sites that, and a large delta feature that this image is showing is again, things that we know on earth where we find these uh, typically show signs of life on Mars. Uh, what we're looking to address through this mission is ancient signs of life, at least to know what might have existed while water was on Mars. But any of those um, clues will really help us know what happened on Mars, if there is that potential life, and really what might have happened in early Earth, because we don't have that record anymore. So lots of ways to address astrobiology. That's the sort of um, field within this. Yes, there was a, that was, I think, one of the first questions I saw come in tonight, a chance to discuss exobiology or astrobiology, biology, or life and other worlds uh, uh, mm -hmm. on other planets. I think that that's, that's definitely uh, something that 
uh, you know, several like several missions that are that are planned are are certainly uh, interested in looking for this not just on Mars but perhaps even in some moons in our outer solar system. So uh, I think uh, astrobiology is a really hot topic, um, and uh, I think a lot of people are really really excited about uh, what uh, are what has been discovered and what is yet to be discovered. Mm -hmm. I think that um, there, we, we talked a little bit about, um, um, the pers well, we've talked a lot about perseverance and we've touched a little bit on the different international missions. Uh, Chris, I believe you had um, a, um, a globe of Mars missions uh, that you could share. Yeah, so um, it's interesting. I'll just uh, bring this up here so we can see it. So this is a three-dimensional model of Mars. I'll just center it up a little bit better so we can see it. And actually, what I can do is I can actually show a different view of Mars. This is a photo view of Mars, but if I actually change this to Mars's topography, so I can make colors to show the high areas and the low areas. Let me just bring that up for us so we have that. So now you can, it, I know it looks a little, a little crazy and dramatic, but you can see that the, the blue areas are the low-lying elevations. So those, are, those would be similar to what we would be have uh, like a seafloor on the earth, a low, very low land below the surface of the water. Now, there's no water on the surface of Mars, of course, but this is a low area. And then the reds are the high areas, including the volcanoes, which we could turn around and look at the other side. And, and as, um, as Baravi mentioned, there's this, this low basin area, the Jezero Crater is near the edge of that. So this is showing some of the mission sites. And one of the neat ones, I can come around here to this side. Let me see if I can find Gale Crater for us here. So here's, here we go. So Gale Crater, the Curiosity Rover is exploring in a place called Gale Crater where we believe the transition between the old, what could have been an old ocean and the land would have been um, long ago. And so they were looking for signs of minerals that were formed in water or that have been altered by being underwater. I have a, I have a globe uh, here, a 3D printed globe actually, that shows uh, what Mars may have once looked like uh, if it had water on its surface. So it's, you can see it's very similar to that, that uh, to, um, map showing the topography of Mars Chris uh, just shared. Uh, and a lot of the low-lying regions is where it's believed the water may have been found with that large, what looks like an ocean uh, near the northern pole and northern hemisphere. Um, so ancient Mars uh, could have had a lot of water. And as uh, by Ravi pointed out uh, and was seen in some of those images of Jezero Crater, um, that water is all dried up and what's been left behind is what looks like ancient uh, lake beds and river beds. So I think that's one of the most exciting things about uh, Perseverance and, and uh, several of the upcoming missions is is uh, is is that is that search and that better understanding of, of Mars's history. I see somebody asked about what if a rover breaks down, and uh, that comes Great back question. to your question about about uh, spirit and opportunity. They were solar powered, but Curiosity and Perseverance are basically nuclear powered. They have little pellets of radioactive material in them that generate heat that are then transformed into electricity. And so they have long, long lifetimes. They're designed to run for years and years and years. So um, as long as there's no mechanical problems, they should be able to safely deposit their, their cash or collection of samples to await a, a future mission. Somebody should talk about the wheels, um, the damage to the wheels on Curiosity. Yes. Curiosity, I believe both Curiosity and Perseverance's wheels are both made of aluminum, but they have a a different design um, uh, because Curiosity's had quite a lot of wear and tear. Um, uh, I think, I think, quite unexpectedly. Yeah, there's no right. paved roads. <laughs> <laughs> no, and and so uh, I believe Perseverance's tires are slightly thicker, so they're hoping that'll help it sort of survive through all of that driving. But to what uh, Chris was mentioning, um, Curiosity was originally scheduled to just last three years and now we're on year eight and so that's uh 
indicating just how much, you know, just changing that sort of battery source is able to help these missions last longer. So Perseverance just arrived. We hope to have it around for a while. Well, we've named quite a few NASA missions, but we've been teasing uh, throughout this event that there are many other international missions uh, visiting Mars. It's a global effort, a collaborative effort, uh, and some of them just arrived in this past week. So uh, we have a question for all of you. How many nations are currently exploring Mars? How many can you name? Um, so uh, let us know in the chat what you think. Uh, we've been talking a lot about NASA and the United States, so that's a bit uh, that that will we'll give you that one to start. Um, <laughs> but as you can think about uh, historically, some that have uh, been exploring Mars but may still be in operation. Um, this doesn't have to be rovers; it could be orbiters. Uh, so let us know in the chat. Uh, how many you think there are currently exploring Mars and name the nations if you can. I think that's something that's really exciting. Uh, and I love uh, Bhairavi that you shared all the all the Canadian contributions uh, to Perseverance because uh, even though we'll list sort of the lead uh, nations, the, the countries that are leading these particular missions, they certainly doesn't happen in in isolation. And I, I think that's mm. that's a great thing about space. That's true. And and uh... Uh, Canadian um, space professionals have all been involved in various stages of Mars, Moon explorations and things like that. So it's always exciting to know who's participating and then what their role is. Uh, um, yeah, one, of the, one of the great things about Mars is that it has a thin atmosphere. So we can use meteorologists to study Mars. We can use people who are, who deal with atmospheres we we need geologists if there's water we would need hydrogeologists we would need chemists all of the various disciplines you know some of the viewers who are watching today may go to school and become specialists in these different fields and they'll all have a role to play mm -hmm. uh, one day when we get to mars uh, as a as a as a species and even like fashion designers or people who need to help astronauts land there safely stay there safely but at the same time um, you know, uh, they're, they're gardeners, design the, design the suits. Yeah. The only thing I could think of that may not be useful is carpentry. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, a really good point. Using, using other materials. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe we'll grow bamboo and domes or that kind of thing and be able to make, you know, construct things out of wood that way. And, and perseverance actually, so it's it's in its infancy of knowing just how well this instrument will work, but it has an instrument called MOXIE that's supposed to essentially derive oxygen from the carbon dioxide atmosphere that is, you know, very much there on Mars. And if it actually works, that uh, gives um, everyone a great chance, at least from both a human perspective, we can have our astronauts uh, um, get more oxygen while they're up there, but it'll also help with maybe fuel and, and trying to help launch those samples and send them back to Earth. So, and it Just could incredible. be used for gardening in some ways, I'm sure. <laughs> so we'll see. We are seeing a lot of responses coming in. Lots of different nations mentioned. Russia, India, US, China, Canada's mentioned. Many, many different nations are mentioned. Uh, so, uh, so far currently uh, is the United States, uh, Russia, um, the European Union. So that includes uh, many different countries. Uh, India, so anyone who mentioned that is correct as well. Uh, and the last two just in the past week uh, joined the United Arab Emirates and also China. So incredibly exciting. Uh, the UAE uh, uh, successfully uh, has the Hope Orbiter. Uh, uh, it arrived uh, last, last Tuesday and then last Wednesday, the Tianwen-1 uh, orbiter uh, from China um, uh, is also arrived and it actually is a combination orbiter, lander and rover. So uh, they will be uh, landing on Mars in a few months. Uh, so that's going to be exciting to watch as well. Mm -hmm. um, our team behind the scenes are telling us that there is a grade two class tuning in right oh. now. So Maybe, Maybe, Public we can, School. Yes. Welcome. Hello. Thanks Welcome. for joining. 
Some of them might be those people that need that will be scientists on Mars. No, we sure. have lots of you know queer possibilities of how to get involved in future missions. For yeah. sure. Awesome. I, there was a question at the very start, I think, of uh, do we think humans will get to Mars soon? So I think all of these missions and, and where we are even today is helping us reach that dream a little um, sooner. So let's hope maybe in your uh, grade two <laughs> generation, we can we can actually see that happen. So we hope. <laughs> All right, we've got uh, another question for the audience. We haven't really talked about uh, land features on, on Mars. We talked a bit about uh, water, um, but uh, Valles Marineris is, is a, a, a canyon, the deepest, largest canyon in our solar system. It's similar in length to A, the Grand Canyon, B, US Route 66, C, the Nile River, or D, the Great Wall of China. Let us know what you think in the chat. Goes quite quite different range of lengths there. Ooh. What's our audience thinking? Mm, we're getting a, a lot of different responses here uh, coming in. Just give everyone a few more minutes. Uh, I can show you here on uh, on the globe that I have of Mars. So there is uh, Valles Marineris. It kind of looks like a scar across the face of the planet there. So remember that it was mentioned that Mars is about half the size of the Earth, maybe a little bit smaller. Um, and then that covers almost one side of the planet. So that might give you a sense of how big it is. It is pretty big. So. so people were people are still um, not 100% sure how that was formed, that giant crack. So I did a little research and it seems that perhaps there was some pressure in that part of the in that part of the globe of Mars and it's called the Tharsis region. And that may have produced a, a crack in the crust of the planet, which then later either slumped through landslides or was maybe eroded. Uh, maybe there was water flowing across uh, to, to there and, and dug it deeper and wider. So it's uh, we need to go there. Yeah, we're yeah. seeing most people are saying D, the Great Wall of China, some A's. The answer is B, U.S. Route 66. So it does span almost the entire continental United States. Uh, and if you compare it in uh, length to Canada, uh, you can see it covers most of Canada as well. And there you can see that sort of Tharsis uh, region, the, those uh, those mountain range, um, sort of on the left side there at the edge of Valles Marineris. So uh, if we go back to just looking at this version of, of um, Mars that would have once had water, you could see that the canyon would have would have then been filled uh, with water. But uh, certainly too too massive to be carved out by water so how like how canyons are are often on earth right so uh, yeah so to to both of what both of you were mentioning um Valles marineris is a combination of tectonics happening on a one plate system unlike on earth where we have continents and oceans on mars it's really the 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 surface is still responding to stresses that it's, it's feeling from underneath or even from outside. And uh, uh, so that may have started the, um, the the crack, but then over time, yes, with, with water movement and, and things like that, it just helped widen it. So there's some parts where it's like really wide. Then there are other parts that are- And how deep is it? How deep and how wide is it? We've, we've seen, talked about the length. So when you compare, um, uh, Valles Marineris to the Grand Canyon that we know of uh, on Earth. Um, we we think that Valles Marineris is about 4,000 kilometers across, which makes sense from the images Rachel just shared, um, but about uh, four kilometers deep in the deepest of uh, wow. areas. So wow. um, Chris, uh, to the program that you're using, if you are able to pull up uh, the Mars topography and so yeah. we can then actually see what that range is. And yeah, there are some parts that are really in those red high elevations and then 
further inward you go into the the floor of the canyon, um, it's comparable to what you're seeing in the sort of northern plains of, of Mars. So um, it, it dug out that deep. <laughs> Wow. It's one of my favorite features. Sorry, go ahead, Louise. We actually have an audience question, and that's about the water. What happened to all the water on Mars, and how did it dry up? Yeah, related to that, where I'm seeing another one, it says, will Earth eventually end up like Mars with no atmosphere or water? So those are both great, great questions. Thank you for those. Um, oh, no. Go ahead, Bravi. Oh, okay, um, so the reason that Mars doesn't have water anymore has to do with our, um, um, essentially, Earth has a magnetosphere, which Mars doesn't, and, and so the, the idea is that over course of time, any water that would have been on the surface of Mars essentially just escaped. And there was nothing, and Mars also has a thin atmosphere, so it wasn't able to hold anything um, significant. And so that's one of those reasons why Mars would have been quite wetter in early days, but it isn't any more. So, um, yeah, but Chris, did you want to add something to that? No, I think you've, yeah, I think you've got it right. So it doesn't have the protection from the sun's uh, radiation, and it also has less gravity because it's a smaller mass planet. Mm -hmm. So there's less gravity to hold on to volatile things. Yeah. Gases, gases and liquids. Thank you for those questions. We don't have to worry about that on Earth because I think yeah. we, we have a little bit of everything. <laughs> so that's going to keep our water um, close We're by. Really good. <laughs> um, we've got, uh, Chris, uh, I know you have a couple different uh, types of software to demonstrate to share with our audience a, a tour of the winter sky. Um, but many are interested in the app uh, that has been, that you've been using so far. Uh, such as one we're seeing right now. Um, could you just share with our audience uh, what the name of the program is? So this uh, this this program is called uh, Starry Night, and uh, it comes in different um, levels. You know, basic, basic, and advanced levels. And it's it starts out as a planetarium application, so I can show you the sky over your house, or we could travel anywhere on the world and look at the sky. But what puts this one a step beyond is that we can actually fly through the universe with it. So if, if I were to say, uh, click on the moon, I can say, go there. And it'll actually launch me off the earth and fly us to the moon. Hmm. So we can view the universe from any location and we can, we, can, we can look at the dynamics of the universe. I can even fly us 3 billion light years away and look at all the galaxies in a map and that kind of thing. So it's a really neat program. Starry Night, it's called. So cool. So definitely encourage everyone to check that out. Um, let's take a look at Blake's telescope. He's got a view of Orion and Taurus, and this is a nice transition to, to talking about uh, the winter sky. Chris and Louise, I know you're going to uh, take some questions about constellations and give us a bit of a winter star tour so our audience knows what objects to look for over the next few few weeks. Yes. All right. So what I'm what I'm doing is I'm actually switching programs, and this this program is called uh, is called Stellarium that I'm going to demo in a minute. I'm going to replicate what Blake's got. So what Blake has done is he's taken a regular DSLR camera and mounted it on a tripod, and then by taking um, a long exposure photograph, he's able to capture a wide view of the sky. Um, you can even get little um, devices that are designed to let people. Uh, track the, the motion of the sky. Uh, Star Adventurer is one of the names that you can get where it's designed to fit a small a, a camera and a lens or perhaps a small telescope and it'll track the sky and allow you to get these long exposure photographs without the star trails forming. So that's a, a terrific thing that you can do. Yeah, so um, let's talk about the night sky a little bit and then we'll get into some of the deep sky objects that uh, our telescope operators have collected for us. Um, I'm now using a program called Stellarium. Uh, S-T-E-L-L-A-R-I-U-M. And the reason I like to use this is because it's a free program that anybody can download and use for themselves. And so once you see how it works, then you can you can get it, and try it for yourself. And it'll work on a PC or a Mac. And there are even some um, uh, smartphone and tablet versions of this if you want to use it that way. So I've got a view of the sky right now over the Toronto, over Toronto, and exactly 
you know, 8.24 p.m. And we can see that we've got a number of bright stars in the sky. We've got the moon tucked up there near Mars tonight. Um, now, the moon has got to orbit the Earth about once a month. So that means it's got to do its 360 degree cycle in about 29 or 30 days. And so every night the moon hops from place to place. So I'm just going to bring up a little time control here. And this will let me put in the date and time. And if I jump to tomorrow night, you can see that the moon will move away from Mars. And actually it's moving up along east along its orbit. And it's moving closer to this little patch of sky. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect the dots for everybody so you can, you can get a sense of where we are and what we're talking about. And this is the constellation of Taurus. So Taurus is the bull. It's on the, uh, it's on the ecliptic. I'll draw the, the yellow line of the ecliptic. So it's one of the zodiac constellations. The planets and the sun and the moon, they all travel close to or on the ecliptic. And, uh, and so tonight, moon is here, and tomorrow night, it'll hop to sit here. And if, if we're lucky enough to have a clear sky, you might notice that if you find the moon, then look to the right, you can see this beautiful object. It's called an open star cluster called the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. I'll just get rid of some of these labels on here so we can see the picture of it a little bit better. So this, the open, an open star cluster are um, a family of stars that were formed from the same cloud at the same, roughly the same time, and they're now moving through space together. And so they'll, they'll sort of remain a group over time. And so that one's called the Pleiades or Seven Sisters. And then yes. to the left of the moon, yep, go ahead. I just actually have a question because you started off by talking about the moon and we actually have an audience question, which, and this is, why is the moon higher in the winter, but lower in the summer? I think that probably relates to, you know, our, our basically our view the tilt of. of yeah. So the easiest way to, de to explain that is what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the celestial equator on the sky here. So if you, if you took the equator of the Earth and drew a strip around the sky right above it, if you lived at the equator, it would be right over your head. But because we live up, live up here in, in southern Ontario, to see that equator, it's in the southern, the southern part of our sky. And it's always in the same height, no matter, the day, no matter what day or, or, um, or time of day it is. That imaginary line of the equator is always there. But the ecliptic, where the planets and the sun and the moon are, it spends part of the ecliptic is above the equator, which means things are higher when they're when they're here. And part of the year or part of the time they're below the equator. So you can see that there's a place where they cross, where the ecliptic and the equator cross. Mm. So in the summertime, when the sun is very high, it sits high above the equator. That means that the moon is like a, it's like a teeter totter. The moon's at the other side of that loop and it's low below the equator. So Summertime suns are high, but nighttime moons are low. And then in the wintertime, the summertime sun is low, so the, the, the wintertime moon is high. It's, it's a little hard to explain without going into more details, but that's, that's the way it works. All right. Thank you. All right. I'm just going to get rid of the equator here so we can continue our little tour. So yeah, what's great about the wintertime sky is all the beautiful bright stars. Um, we have uh, Taurus the bull, which I just pointed out where the moon will be um, tomorrow night. And then we have Orion with its beautiful three-starred belt. And I'm just gonna zoom in on Orion a little bit here. Oh, Ashley, I've got an image coming from Ian, one of our scope operators. He has an image of the Pleiades, which we were just looking at just a moment before. That's fantastic. Oh, yeah, so that's... in in uh, in binoculars, uh, binoculars are your best tool for looking at the Pleiades because it's it's actually quite big in the sky compared to other things, and so they, it fits nicely in binoculars. So you can look for um, to the unaided eye, you could see six or seven stars, but in binoculars, you'll see many, many more. And that blue, the blue um, ghostly color um, in and amongst the stars you see in Ian's picture, that's actually um, interstellar dust and gas that the stars of the Pleiades are reflecting or scattering off of and giving that um, that nebulous glow. It's called um, reflection nebula, which you get between the stars. 
And that's the dust that those stars had formed from originally, right? Left over. Well, I think yes. I think in this case, it's probably that the stars have been traveling as a family and that they've now at the current time, they're passing through a region of the galaxy where um, they have a lot of, but there's a lot of dust around them. So they're getting that scattering of light. So maybe it won't always be, look that way, but at the present time it will. And that'll last for quite a number of years, of course. That's, that's definitely a great tip just to, just even with a pair of binoculars, you'll be able to see quite a few more stars and just the six or seven that you might normally be able to see with the naked eye. Exactly. And speaking of looking at the stars, next time you're out on a clear night, pay attention to the differences between them. Of course, we're used to stars being brighter and dimmer, but you may not have recognized that they actually shine with a different color, slightly different tints. So this bright star that's up near the V shape of Taurus's face, the star Aldebaran is a kind of an orangish, a little bit reddish star. Um, it's just evolved differently from some of the other stars. Whereas if, if you compare that star to say the stars of Orion's belt, those are hot, sort of hot white stars. So the star colors vary according to the temperatures they're burning out or shining at. Um, and um, one of the neat things you can do if you're out on a clear night and you've got a nice big sky uh, view of the sky is to trace out the giant winter hexagon or winter football. And what you can do is, is look to the lower uh, east here and you can find this very bright star named Sirius. So Sirius nickname is the dog star because he's the brightest star in the constellation of Canis Major, the big dog. And uh, you may recognize the name Sirius from Harry Potter because J.K. Rowling adopted the names of the star for one of the characters in the book. But Sirius um, had the name before, before it appeared in the Harry Potter books. So Sirius is the brightest star in the entire sky, except the sun. Of course, the sun is a star as well. But in, as far as the nighttime goes, you can't get a star brighter than Sirius. And Sirius is bright like that because it's, um, it's vigorously burning its fuel, fusing its hydrogen, but also it's not very far away. So a star that's closer to the Earth or our solar system will shine a little brighter than one that's farther away. And Sirius is about eight and a half light years away. So the light from it has been traveling for that length of time. And what's, what's fun to think about is if there was an alien civilization on a planet orbiting Sirius, then it would take about eight, eight or nine years for them to receive our signal. And if they wanted to send a message back, we could wait another eight and a half years for that answer to come back. So we could have this really long delayed telephone conversation using radio signals and that delay. But if you, if you start, with, start with Sirius and then you can jump up from there to the upper right and look for really bright Rigel. Rigel is the, the lower foot of Orion, the Western foot of Orion. Rigel is a sort of a bluish white star. Then if you go up from Rigel, you, you land at our friend Aldebaran in, Terra, in, in Taurus. I'm just going to zoom out a little bit here. And then head up to the left and almost straight overhead. So this letter Z here is showing the sky directly overhead. So up here, there's a star named Capella, and it's a yellowish tinted star. So we've gone from Sirius up to Rigel, up to Aldebaran, up to Capella. And now we can head down the other side. We can go to Castor and Pollux the twins of Gemini. And they, even though they're called twins, they're, the two stars are not quite the same visually. You can see a little difference in them. And then down to this bright star named Procyon. And Procyon is the brightest star in the little dog constellation. I can actually bring that the art in a minute. And then back to Sirius. So you can see we've, we've created a giant loop in the sky. And between, I think, Saturday and next Tuesday, the moon is going to actually pass right through that that circle of stars in the sky. We call that an asterism. It's not a constellation because it's made out of many constellations. It's sort of an informal pattern in the sky. Okay. Well, since we're in this area of the sky, uh, we have another image coming from another one of our telescope operators. And this is the Crab Nebula uh, in the Messier catalog. This is M1. Oh, very nice. Nice. Very nice. So I'll show everybody where that is. That object is um, amazing to see if you have a big telescope or a, you can take a long exposure photograph. It's actually the leftovers of a supernova, a star that exploded as a supernova about a thousand years ago. Um, we know that because Chinese astronomers 
actually recorded in their notes that they saw a star appear in the sky that was so bright you could see it in the daytime, even with the sun shining. And then it faded after a few days and became the brightest star in the nighttime sky. And now if we look in that same patch of sky, it's up here near the, the tip of the horn of Taurus. So Taurus's face is here and his two horns stick up. And this lower horn, if we zoom in, and I'll zoom in a little bit more, and you can see that there's a little patch of light right here, and that's the Crab Nebula, that's where it is. It's actually about, I think it's about a finger's width. Yeah, it's about a finger's width away from this star, which is a naked eye star. But you can't, it's dim by now because the explosion is, has dissipated and is fading in brightness. Uh, now you need a picture um, such as Francois made in order to see it, but it's really a cool idea, this, this supernova explosion. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's really cool because we know when it happened and now we know what a nebula looks like, you know, in the thousand years it's taken to form. Yeah, it's so, like two data points, really yeah. good data points that we have. Yeah. Um, speaking, of, speaking of supernovas, maybe we should talk about Betelgeuse. Oh, yes. I think Betelgeuse was in the news uh, just, um, just last year, wasn't it? Because it had dimmed. And that got yeah. lots of people really excited, thinking, you know, maybe, possibly. Uh, but maybe if you could tell us a little bit more about Betelgeuse. It's so Betelgeuse is, Betelgeuse is the um, star in the upper left or eastern um, corner of Orion. It's, it actually, its name means his armpit from, <laughs> from, from Arabic, which is kind of fun. But um, yeah, Betelgeuse is a very noticeably reddish or orangish star in the sky, if you look at it. And that's because it's a very old star. It's, it's gone into its red giant phase. Um, it's located about 500 light years away. And so we think that it's getting ready to explode in a supernova, just like the Crab Nebula did, the one up near Taurus. But we don't have to worry because it's so far away that it won't hurt us or affect us in any way. But it will be spectacular if we, could, if we see it explode. It'll be that really bright star that, we, that the Chinese recorded. Now, a year ago, back in around November, December of 2019, um, suddenly Betelgeuse got really dim. Uh, normally, it's quite a bright star, but it dimmed really noticeably, and, and astronomers wondered whether maybe it was getting ready to explode. Um, a lot of us were excited. We would go out every night we could and look at it and see if we got, you know, to be the first ones to see it blow up. But uh, after a few months, then it, it increased in brightness again, back to, back to pretty much normal. And astronomers think that what happened is that maybe, maybe the star um, has a different, uh, a few different phenomena that make it dim and bright naturally, and maybe they all sort of synchronized, so they all caused it to get even extra dim for a period of time. Or maybe there was an orbiting cloud of opaque dust that maybe partially blocked the light of the star for a short time until it moved away. So uh, yeah, that's Betelgeuse. Well, I tell people who come to the planetary when they ask about Betelgeuse, I say, well, it's worth it to just to keep looking, but at the same time, not to get your hopes up. Could it be any time between now, possibly in the next, I don't know, hundred, few hundred, maybe a thousand years? It's well, hard to say, right? Yeah. Astronomers say young, but, but to them, young is a long time, right? Uh, so right. soon, astronomically soon could mean a thousand <laughs> years, but... <laughs> soon in the sense of the scale of the universe's time. Um, maybe we can get some views from our telescope operators of some of the neat things in Orion. Oh, yeah. Okay, so we've got one here. Um, this is from, uh, oh, it's another nebula. It's, uh, this is from Francois. It's M78. And uh, this is... Uh, yeah, there it is. Casper the Ghost Nebula. Yeah, so... Casper the Ghost is another one of those situations where there are stars inside a cloud of material and the light is scattering off the, the dusty material and producing this, this emission nebula. And I can show everybody where that is. So if you look at Orion and find the three stars of his belt, then that object, which you might see in binoculars in a, on a very dark moonless night, but it's better in a, in a long exposure photograph. It's about about two or three finger widths above the left star of Orion's belt. So that's this object right here that I'm circling. It's called uh, Casper the Friendly Ghost or 
uh, Messier 78, I believe is its other designation. So that, that's a cool one. But, but we haven't looked at my favorite thing yet. Oh, I bet it's yours too. Well, for sure. Yeah. Can we take a closer look? Yeah. So if you're out on the next clear night, you don't even need your binoculars, but it helps if you have some. So start with the three stars of Orion's belt, Al Natak, Al Nalam, and Mintaka. And then find his sword that hangs down from his belt. You can see that with your unaided eyes. And usually it looks about as if there are about three patches of light or three stars in his sword. But if you use your binoculars, you'll you'll come to see that the middle, the middle object or the middle blob of light is fuzzy. And it's actually a nebula called Messier 42 or the Great Orion Nebula. And I believe we've got our telescope view of that one as well. This yeah. one is from Ian. That's from Ian. That's amazing. Oh, that's beautiful. Now you might notice that the um, the picture looks different from mine for a couple of reasons. First off, through most smaller telescopes, um, visually, you're not going to see the colors that you see um, on my Stellarium screen. So a Hubble Space Telescope image with using collecting lots of photons will be able to collect the light, different colors and different wavelengths. But your eyes through a small telescope will generally see these objects in black and white. So don't expect to see the spectacular color. Th those colors, though, are caused by the hydrogen gas glowing with the red light and then the blue, the blue dust scattering the blue lights. So you'll get the mixture of the blues and the reds give you the pinks and purples that we're seeing in this view. Mm -hmm. And the, the other thing is that the optics of a telescope system use mirrors and lenses and they tend to flip the object upside down. And, you know, we don't care. We're not, you know, reading maps in this, uh, through our telescope of things in the sky. So we don't really care if they're upside down or mirror imaged. But um, you will you will see a difference in, through your binoculars than through your telescope, where it might it might turn the object upside down or mirror image it left to right. And the other thing you're got you might see is if in the view of um, Francois here, there's a really bright patch in the middle of the nebula, and that's actually a clump of young stars that were born from this gas, and they're shining. Their light is shining and and lighting up the uh, gas around them. And in a telescope, even if a backyard, a small backyard telescope, if you point your telescope at that clump of bright stars, you'll see it forms the shape of a trapezoid, four stars in a sort of a, a crooked rectangle or a trapezoid shape. There's a better view of it. He's got it now. And uh, that's called the trapezium. It's a nickname for it because of that. And if you have a really nice big telescope in a nice dark sky, sometimes you can even catch a glimpse of a few extra stars tucked in that grouping. So that's a neat object, but definitely the trapezium is visible in any size um, amateur telescope, backyard telescope. We have another image from another of our telescope operators. This one's from Blake, and it's the Sigma Orionis Cluster. This is a double star system. All right, let's see if we can bring up the Sigma Orionis picture here. There we go. So this is a really neat thing. This is actually an example of um, a double, both a double star and a star cluster at the same time. So if you're looking at Orion's belt, um, you'll notice that there's a pretty medium bright star just below the left hand or eastern star of Orion's belt. And that star's designation is Sigma. So in, um, in astronomy, we give stars either names, or if they're not as important or not as bright, we give them Greek letters. So Sigma would be somewhere down the alphabet in the order of brightness. And if you look at that star in a telescope, it suddenly is revealed to be a double star. So two stars that are that are close to one another in the sky. And in fact, there's actually a group of about um, in a in a medium sized telescope, you might pick up six or seven stars in the shape of a narrow dart. You can see the sort of a in Blake's picture, there's kind of a, a point on the left and then a clump in the middle and then a, a few three on the right. That's that sort of dart shape. I mean, I was um, sort of calling that Cupid's arrow for uh, for Valentine's Day the other day. Um, and a big telescope and a long exposure photograph will, will, will identify dozens of stars in this group. It's, um, it's basically an open cluster, just like the Pleiades was an open cluster. So that's a double star. Oh, that's um, nice. Double well, stars should... can actually be double because they're they're actually orbiting each other or just because they happen to be in the same direction in the sky and appear next to one another. 
Um, Chris, since you mentioned um, the naming of stars, I actually have an audience question here. And this is about the, uh, the Casper the Ghost Nebula. Um, so this is from Inea, age 10. And the question was, was Casper the Friendly Ghost, was it named after the movie? Well, some of the names of deep sky objects um, were picked a long time ago, and some of them were picked more recently. And um, sometimes astronomers think they see a shape or um, you know, a creature or something, and they say, I think this reminds me of something, so I'll give it this nickname. And then it catches on and people start using it all the time. So uh, the Casper the Friendly Ghost, I think probably an astronomer took a look and on that night he thought, oh, I kind of see a shape of a ghost there. So I'm going to call him Casper the Friendly Ghost. And then it's nice because it's memorable and you remember it. And so you're able to say, oh, I should look at that one. And then uh, see if you think the same, see if you feel the same when you look at it. So yeah, yeah there are a few sure. like that that are interesting. All right. This is another image from our scope operator, Ian. And this is a picture of the Horsehead Nebula. And if, it, if we can zoom in a little bit, we'll be able to see that horse's head shape really well. Yeah. So what's happening there is you've got the red color. That's the hydrogen gas in the cloud. And then that bright, bright star just in the left of the center of, the, of Ian's picture there, that's Alnatak. That's the left star of Orion's belt. And then up in the upper right, you can see there's a little group of, uh, less bright, but a little group of stars in the upper right. That's Sigma Orionis. The, the picture's just turned, rotated 90 degrees so okay. that up is to the up is to the left. Um, and the belt goes up from, from Alnatak. But that, that red gas is glowing. And then there's some of that dark dust in the foreground and it's blocking yeah, it's blocking the red hydrogen gas to me in the shape of a horse's head. Here's a neat video where we're going to zoom in and see the 3D structure of, of what's going on. Wow. So yeah, so that dust is in is between us and the glowing gas, and it makes a silhouette. And there's a there's a rendering of the dimensions. Isn't that amazing? It is. And then there are stars tucked inside there. Perhaps there's some baby solar systems being born inside that cloud. That's really cool. Yeah, it's beautiful. The horse head is not an easy one to look at through a backyard telescope, but it really is a beautiful object if you've got um, you know, a camera that can take a long exposure. Nice. And if you look at to the left, there's a, a kind of um, a bright patch with almost a dark tree in the middle of it sort of pointing to the left, that's called the flame nebula. And it's, it's actually a bit brighter than the horse head, so you might have a chance of seeing that one on a, on a dark moonless night. Now, I just wanted to mention a little bit about Sirius. Sirius is uh, interesting because it doesn't get very high in the sky for people living in Toronto and, and in um, Southern Ontario. Um, and because it's stays rather low in the sky, we're looking at it or we're viewing it through lots of the Earth's atmosphere. And the more atmosphere between you and the star, the more chance of it to distort or cause twinkling effects. And because Sirius is so bright, it has a, it's famous for this really cool effect of giving you flashes of color. So if you stand there and watch Sirius on a clear night for a minute or two, and you might see a flash of red, and then a green and then blue and then white again. And it just sort of changes color as you watch it. It's almost like a sparkling diamond. It's really neat. Yeah, that's, that's actually totally worth looking for. I, I myself couldn't spot any colors, but I, when I went out with my family uh, last week, it was, it was really clear so we could see Sirius and it really does sparkle. Like the, the twinkling effect is amazing. So totally worth looking for. Oh, all right. I was wondering, Chris, could you recommend some astronomy apps that we could use on, uh, say, if uh, we wanted to go out, um, do some stargazing with our, with a smartphone, if we don't have like binoculars or anything, what you would recommend? Sure. So I, I shared with uh, I shared with Rachel some of my favorite astronomy apps. I really like the ones that show the sky realistically. 
um, and show the planets at their true brightness and the true size and things like that. You can get apps that make the planets really big so that it's very obvious which ones they are. And that's good too, if you want to be definitely sure about what you're seeing. But um, you can get a version of Stellarium, the program I've been using for the smartphone called Stellarium Mobile. Um, it might, some of these apps might cost you a couple of dollars. Um, some of them are free, some of them cost an inexpensive amount. And there are sometimes different versions of them as well. Um, the one that astronomers really like to use is called Sky Safari. And it's really great because not only is it realistic, but it's also really accurate and it contains a lot of features that you can use to say, see what sort of a patch of sky your particular eyepiece would show in your telescope, or you can plot the orbits of comets and do all kinds of advanced things and search for objects by their, their family of type and things like that. Um, it also comes in a, in, a, in a basic, medium and advanced level, and you can pay a little or a bit more or a bit more. But there's a trick and that is that if you download the uh, Celestron Sky Portal app, it's made by the same company and it's free. And you can get it for uh, Android or, smart, or iOS, so smartphones or, uh, or Google or Android phones. That's good too. Um, Astrospheric is what a lot of us astronomers use for predicting the weather for stargazing. Um, stargazing depends on whether it's clear or cloudy, but it also depends on is the air really turbulent, causing all that twinkling, or is the air really transparent? Is there smoke in it or moisture to make things a bit dimmer? And so this Astrospheric app will let you dial in your location and it'll give you um, squares that are dark blue when it's good of good stargazing and, and sort of white and gray when it's not so good. And it's done hour by hour of the day. And you can actually get a, a forecast for the coming week using that app. And it also has when the space station is flying over, when the moon is rising and setting, it's really cool, really full featured for astronomers. Um, now, if you wanna look for satellites, um, I really like the um, ISS detector app. And that's neat because when a, when a space station pass is happening, you get um, an animated diagram on, on your smartphone with um, a circle. And when you tilt your phone to put the circle on the symbol for the, for the space station, then your phone is aiming right at it. And so you can know exactly where to sky to look for it. So that's a really neat one. There, there's there's uh, Rachel showing that one now. Um, Sputnik is a version of the similar thing that you can do for, a, a, for an, a, an iPhone. ISS detector is an Android. Now, if you want to look at the moon in detail, grab your, your telescope and start figuring out which, which crater is which and that kind of thing. Um, the Moon Globe app is really good um, for Android, for um, iOS, and the Lunar Map Lite is a free app, and it's for Android. And what's cool is that it draws a line showing you where the phase of the moon is currently. Um, it actually labels all the different features, and you can use your fingers to pinch and zoom and magnify. Um, it'll even let you flip the moon over if you're looking at it through a telescope and your view is flipped. And it also, you can skin the moon with different maps. So you can have old um, NASA maps, or you can have modern um, views of the moon. So you get different, you know, get the view that best matches what you're seeing through a telescope. So those are some, some inexpensive or free apps that are recommended. Thanks for sharing that, Chris. I know uh, by Ravi, you weighed in, and you, so these are some of your favorites uh, as well. Um, I'd love to take a look at the telescope views again uh, from our different telescope operators. I believe that Ian has two galaxies in view, Messier objects 81 and 82. We haven't seen any images of galaxies yet. Um, so just just stunning. I just love these two galaxies. M82 kind of looks a little bit like a cigar shape, um, but uh, they're located uh, around where the Big Dipper is in the sky and it's in the northern sky, up yeah. nice and high over the next few months. You will need a telescope. These aren't naked eye objects. Um, uh, he's, Ian is using a, a five inch telescope uh, to observe uh, these galaxies. You should be able to see them in binoculars, at least um, the brighter one. Yeah. Um, the trick is if you, tar if you start with the bowl of the Big Dipper, which right now is pointing upwards, um, start with the lower right-hand star and draw a diagonal up through the upper left star and then double that distance. And that's where those two galaxies are. 
Oh, that's a great tip. That's a great way to uh, sort of guide our eyes to where they are. And I know there was a question, uh, Thea H6 asked, how many stars are in the universe? And this is a great question because we're looking at galaxies. Wow. Uh, galaxies, it's hard to imagine how many stars there are in the universe because it's such a big number. Um, at least in our own Milky Way galaxy, there are hundreds of billions of stars. Uh, uh, the nearest major galaxy to us is the Andromeda galaxy, and that has over one trillion stars. Um, so I think I think if on average we say, let's say most galaxies have several hundred billion stars, and there are several hundred billion galaxies, that's that's a big number with a lot of zeros. <laughs> yeah, you can't <laughs> you can't look anywhere and not find a galaxy in the sky if you have a big enough telescope use Hubble or something like that. Even an empty patch of sky is filled with galaxies. They're just so far away, they're faint. I think Francois has a collage of, of many different deep sky objects that he's uh, he's taken uh, uh, to share with us. I think that this really encapsulates uh, why the night sky is so inspiring to look at. I think it shows uh, why astrophotography can be an awesome hobby. Um, uh, if you're interested in getting started, you can get started to take some of those tips from Tanya as uh, video. We'll start with the moon. Uh, I know that she takes those images uh, from where she lives in Toronto. Uh, so even in a light blue sky, you can you can still do some astrophotography. But I love this combination of different nebulae and star clusters. Uh, Lots of different deep space objects here in view. That's right. Well, we'll have to do another session maybe in the summertime where we can tour through some of the beautiful things to see in the summer Milky Way. Yes, the summer Milky Way, can we see towards the center uh, of the galaxy? So there's a lot, lot more uh, brightness and uh, uh, you can see a lot more of, of the gas and dust and sort of the plane towards the center of the Milky Way in the summer months. But the, I always love the winter sky uh, for the reasons uh, that uh, you shared in your in your sky tour, Chris, is that all of those bright stars, Louise, when you were talking about how serious twinkles in the sky, there's something it's just so, so lovely about going on a nice, cool night, uh, clear night, <laughs> unlike this one. Um, but uh, and just looking up at the at the sky and seeing all those stunning bright bright stars so many objects uh, to find somebody asked how many constellations are there and can mm -hmm. the constellations tell you where to go mm -hmm. so I know there the answer do you know 80, the answer 88 official constellations that have been named by the International Astronomical Union. Similar body that is also responsible for naming features uh, in our solar system and bodies, but uh, there are 88 official ones, but then there are different cultures who also identify constellations just based on their own um, community or histories and things like that. So um, I'm sure the number of constellation names are, are more. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's the first part to your question, but now I've, I've, uh, forgotten the second half, so maybe Rachel can repeat it. <laughs> the, the second part was, can constellations tell you where to go? Of well, course. Of course. <laughs> you can think of it as your roadmap. So to all the images that were being shared by our telescope operators and what uh, Chris was showing on the, the journey, you essentially use your constellations as guides to know where to look up in the night sky. And then it's like you're you're like a little detective, like a constellation detective or even a star detective, because then that helps you um, figure out where some of these objects and and um, images. Uh, and there's always are. Polaris. That's true. Yeah. True. So Polaris will tell you where North is if you learn to <laughs> identify Polaris. Yeah. So. There's the North Star, uh, um, it's a little bit fainter, not the brightest star in the sky, um, but uh, you can use, if you can spot the, the stars in the Big Dipper, you can use uh, the front two stars uh, in the, in the sort of bowl shape of the constellation of the asterism uh, and trace that and guide your eye up to the Polaris, the North Star. So 
constellations and stars and have long been uh, used for navigation, for guiding your way around the sky. And it's also uh, fun to use your imagination to come up with your own asterisms, your own patterns. Um, you know, Chris mentioned the winter hexagon. Some may see a football. You may see something <laughs> else. So uh, next time you go up and, and look at the moon and see the different features of the mare on the moon, you know, Use your imagination. And what do you see? Do you see Wilma Flintstone? Do you see a rabbit? Or do you see uh, a face? Next time you go up and look at the stars and look at the constellations, uh, what do you see? Uh, I hope uh, you are inspired to uh, um, keep exploring and keep looking up. I want to thank all of our guests tonight, and I want to thank our audience for your incredible questions. Um, we've had so much fun with all of you. There have been so many amazing questions. Uh, so thank you so much for engaging with us tonight. I want to give a special shout out before I wrap things out too, to the team that worked on the Perseverance uh, rover mission. Um, it must have been a very exhausting and stressful day, but I think that just shows uh, the uh, great great work of collaboration and innovation and perseverance uh, that led to today's success. So anybody watching, give a big round of applause uh, for the Perseverance team. Uh, thank you to uh, my co-hosts tonight, uh, Louise, Bhairavi, and Chris. Um, we had an awesome uh, team of telescope operators. So I want to thank uh, Ian, Blake, and from for sharing all their incredible, incredible images with us. And I've also shared a um, uh, uh, big thank you to Tanya as well for sharing and creating that fabulous video of how to take an image of the moon uh, with your own smartphone. So thank you so much to all of them. Uh, our whole team behind the scenes, Jana, Andrew, Carrie, Leah, and Andrea, thanks again so much. Um, any final words uh, from each of you? By Ravi, I'll start with you. Um, so I will recommend, since that last question was about constellations, a uh, plug-in for the RASC Starfinder that's available online. You can download it and have your own little Starfinder to then uh, figure out what the constellations are up where you are at any time of the year. So that'll be my little added recommendation. But otherwise, uh, bundle up. And, and if you have clear skies, uh, enjoy seeing what's up in the night sky. Awesome. Louise, any tips from you? Final comments from you? Oh, definitely bundle up, warm socks. And actually, if you're going to use your smartphone to do any uh, like stargazing or anything like that, get one of those styluses. I think you can get them at the dollar store. But that way you don't have to take off your gloves if you want to do something on the screen. <laughs> then you don't get cold hands. That's a great tip. <laughs> what about you, Chris? Um, don't be so uh, quick to need a telescope. Um, Lots of people have binoculars, and it's amazing how much you can see with just binoculars. Um, if you start with Sirius and just scan the sky near Sirius and go upwards, you'll discover all kinds of, of star clusters and cool little things that are hidden in the sky that binoculars are perfect for. So, uh, so give that a try. That's a great tip. Thanks again to our team of telescope operators, Ian, Francois, Blake, and special thanks to Tanya for sharing the video of uh, how to take a, a smartphone image of the moon. So RASC Toronto Centre is an amazing partner. I definitely encourage you to check out their events. Uh, you can also uh, follow them on their various social channels and I hope you could, will follow uh, the Ontario Science Centre as well. Uh, we have a large collection of activities all around Mars uh, on our website that you can check out in case you missed any of those events uh, leading up to today's successful landing of Perseverance. Take care, everyone, and stay safe. Clear skies. Keep looking out. Bye. Bye.